Um, so we've been, uh, this is kind of the big modules or topics that we've been going through while we study evangelism. You know, what is evangelism? The importance of the lost to God to make sure you, you have the heart that Jesus has. And then really, if you have that, then you will just be evangelistic. It's just how it works. We talked about some motivations for evangelism, uh, the, the work of prayer in evangelism. We have to have God on our side. Uh, we, it, you know, be praying for opportunities, hoping you, uh, hopefully you've continued to do that in your daily prayers. You prayed for the opportunity for God to bring people into your life so you can share the gospel with them. Um, and then we just finished the module on evangelism for everyone, how this is a group effort. Evangelism is not just for a select few, it is for everyone. Now, that may not be, um, that may not look the same for everyone. We all have different strengths, we're all different parts of the body, but together, united, we can have a great impact and evangelize many in, in, this, in this community. Um, and if you remember, just to review the last class that we talked about, uh, we talked about how we can really... Um, really think about how we can evangelize, make the best opportunities for those who uh, come into this building. Those seekers, those people who are not Christians, but are seeking, and because of God, because of maybe your invitation, they come into this building. How can we, um, as representatives of God, make the best of those opportunities? And do you remember what were some of those things that, that we suggested that were good things to keep in mind? Yeah. Yeah. We could, yeah. Yeah. We ha Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we we have some uh pins back there and uh little cards and stuff like that we talked about. So um, I think that's that's that would be really good. What what else did we suggest as far as you know when people come in here, what are people thinking? How can we make them the most welcome? Be yeah, be very friendly. Um, talk to them. Like I think we've all been to churches where like no one talked to you. You went in and you sat and like no one talked to you. And how did that make you feel? Um, and we don't want people who are s seeking for uh, the lost to come up with a, b a bad impression. Uh, what else? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. So, you know, they're wondering where to sit, where's a good place to sit, being very friendly, having relationships, um, you know, asking, hey, you, you want to sit by me? You know, that's, that, that's wonderful. Yeah. Make sure that they have a place to, uh, to, to park. Maybe there's, uh, make sure there's places um, available for them. That's good. Any others? I, th I think anything to do to build a relationship with them, because um, that's the biggest thing. If you want to be the people that are representative of the gospel and have the opportunities to teach, you have to build uh, a re relationship, um, and, and anything like, like that is key. You know, once you make that contact, you know, having a good conversation with them. Um, eventually, maybe even having them over for dinner, um, having them over for lunch after church, all those kinds of things. Anything to build that relationship will lead to a better better visual. Um, and, and what do we have that's attractive to seekers? What do we have to offer offer through through God? What has God given us? His word. His word and one other thing. That's really attractive. Love, which is all of that, yes, to, as a thing. Truth, his word, and love. Those two things are very attractive to people. People don't get real love out in the world many times. Many people don't, and it, they experience that 
Uh, It's very attractive. Um, And also truth, like actually having something that we rely on. Because there's a lot of false people out there. People who say one thing or, 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 you know, keep changing the agenda or whatnot. Uh, We have this one book that we stick with. And and that makes us very attractive. Um, A lot lot more attractive than other churches. One thing that makes us so much more attractive than uh, other churches is that we actually study the Bible. It's not just some workbook or some different book, which those aren't bad. But if that's the exclusive way you study the Bible, then that is bad. Um, and so that could be very attractive that we have the truth, we have salvation, we have all those things that are contained about. And, and we need to. Um, I, I think I told you this, um, that it, it, we're kind of disadvantaged on first impressions compared to other congregations because we don't have a band. If they're used to you know, uh, Christianity or with their perception of Christianity, it usually comes with a band. That's what they think of. Um, and we're, we're older, we're older congregation. And so right there, we, we're at a little bit of a disadvantage, but that means we have to be very cognizant of being very friendly, very loving, and sound in our truth in the Bible and present it in that way. So uh, anything else on that before we uh, move Yes, uh, that is a great rule of thumb. Um, you're, you're, this is the truth. It doesn't matter what I believe. It matters what this book is. And just kind of have that constant thought. Um, and that, that's really good. Anything else before we move on? Okay. Um, so this last, this last one, the process of personal evangelism, uh, these are the kind of main topics that we'll be hitting on. Not all of these is a separate class. But these are just kind of the, the topics that we'll be hitting on. Uh, John 4, that's what we'll talk about today. Uh, and then we'll talk about the process of becoming a Christian, what that process looks like as you help someone become a Christian. Understanding religious investment, we don't really talk about that necessarily, but is um, something good to understand about the person that you're trying to teach. Uh, understanding doubt, another great thing to understand when you're teaching someone, not all doubt is the same. Doubt comes from different places, and so if you can get to the root of that, you can have more success. Uh, And then just some personal evangelism basics, and then finally a small group Bible studies and how those can be helpful uh, in in, uh, personal evangelism. So those are the kind of different topics that we'll go through in in this section. Um, But to start off, uh, we'll be looking at John 4, a master class. And and there's this, this, uh, this company, this website, that uh, takes re- people who are really good at, at people who are really good at what whatever they do, um, and they are masters at their craft. And they have them record a series of videos that teach them um, why, how they do what they do, and hopefully to impart some skill to those who are watching that they can have um, some kind of uh, develop some kind of skill um, like them. And you see that they have all kinds of different people. You have chess players, you have uh, basketball players, you have singers, you have writers, you have tennis players. You have a whole litany of different people. Um, And they each are teaching their different craft. Well, I I think John 4 is the master class on evangelism. It's Jesus, the master teacher, teaching how to be evangelistic. Because it's almost everything is, is in this one uh, story. And so um, I kind of debated whether to wait until the end to do this as like a big cutoff or to kind of start off this section. I I decided to start off because it it really contains a lot of what we have talked about and what we will talk about. Um, And so I kind of just want to look at John 4 and see what Jesus has to teach us about uh, reaching reaching the lost. And so let's uh, let's start. We're going to uh, look at this story in four main sections. Um, the first will be verses 5 through verse 9. So John chapter 4, starting in verse 5. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus tried, and Jesus, tired as he, uh, as he was from the journey, 
sat down by the well, and it was about noon. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew. I am a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So what here can we learn from Jesus about teaching the lost, about evangelism? Excuse me? It's for everyone. Why might we think it's not for everyone? Okay, but us as the teacher, why would we not think it's for everyone? Yeah, there you go, yeah. I well, mean, I think they're good enough. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, there was a societal pressure, a cultural pressure uh, to... Um, to not associate with with those people. What are, what are some some different cultural or societal barriers that may exist today for different people? Just some generic ones. Politics, yes, yeah, politics. I, I think that's becoming more and more of a thing, unfortunately. Um, and yeah, I, yeah, politics should not have any bearing on who you teach. Should not. It doesn't matter as much, not nearly as much. Um, so yeah, what else? Sports. Yeah, different teams. Yeah, good. Someone from Alabama <laughs> very much know that. Yeah. People up uh, up north don't get that as much unless you're from Ohio State and Michigan. They kind of do. Yeah. But yeah, good. What else? Religion, okay. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, kind of prejudice against their, their religion. Or I, I would even uh, maybe add an additional group is, like, they're just immoral. Like, they're, they're either from, you know, this religion that would never accept the gospel or they're just so bad that they would never accept the gospel. Yeah, good. Bill? Oh. Yep, the way they're dressed, their appearance. Yeah, different cultural differences. Yeah, yeah. You've pit most of them: race, economic condition, political affiliation, personality, appearance, moral condition. And, and I don't want you to answer necessarily out loud, but which is the hardest for you? Which one's the one that that is the? Um, what group of people do you think are not important in God's eyes? But we have those people. You know how I know is because I have those those people. We have those people in our mind that that we don't want to get to know, and we don't want to present the gospel to, for whatever reason. Um, and th- th- if it's a constant struggle as a human to break down those barriers and see people as as a soul, as, as uh, how Jesus saw them. And it's very important to do that. This is what Jesus did here. It was a woman, which was, men and women weren't supposed to really talk in public that much unless it was just transactional. Um, you know, and then a Samaritan woman, which had bad blood with, with the Jews. Um, and then, you know, they're just not supposed to communicate with each other. And yet he's like, I don't care. I'm going to take this opportunity with this, this person. What else in, the, in this section? It does. It does. Yeah. If, if you, um, if a person or a person from a certain group has hurt you in the past, it's very easy to become prejudiced to that person or that group of people. Um, and so you just got, you have to realize that, realize those feelings and um, try to push past that and let love overcome that, that fear and that hurt. 
Yep, there's educational difference there as well. Yeah, th these are all things that can be a barrier, a cultural, societal barrier in, in our life. And you know, it didn't let G stop Jesus, and it shouldn't stop us either. It, it is it is a uh, they're living out a lot of what what it, it means to be evangelist to all people yep yeah yes yeah it, it's it is very hard um, so I I mean I think we could go all night with different people that um, it may be hard to evangelize, but I think the point is, is like whoever they are, God still cares about them. And God still cares about their soul, and we should still care about their soul. That's what that's why I started this whole um, class on, is if you don't care about the person, none of this will matter. If if you care about the person, everything else will cover, you'll, you'll get there eventually. So, yeah, God cares. What else about what Jesus did uh, is it good for us to learn? Yeah. Yeah, he was not in the best, you know, physical state. You know, it, very easy to be like, and it's not like he hasn't been preaching or anything. You know, you can say, you know, I've been, I've been evangelizing, I've been preaching to all these people. I'm tired. You know, I just want to sit here and relax and I'll let the disciples go get some, some food. And it very easy, could have taken off. But instead, um, he took every opportunity. He constantly searched. Um, uh, Philippians 2, 3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or even conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. And this is part of valuing others above ourself, that even when we're tired or things are not optimal, we still take those opportunities. Um, no matter what. Good. What else? Yeah. Just taking advantage of whatever happens in the present. Wherever, yeah. Wherever. You can't wait for the perfect prospect. I feel like that's what we do. We we wait for the perfect person and in which we can reveal the gospel. But that doesn't really exist. <laughs> we gotta take wherever we are, whoever we meet, we evangelize. And we we tell people the gospel because that's what we're told to do. How did he go out of his way? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so he, he didn't avoid people that um, that most society would avoid. He went to those people. And not just the Americans, the tax collectors, like these general people that people in the society avoided, he went to and he built a relationship with and he talked to and he, he treated with respect. Um, and those people that are generally not treated well in our society, we need to treat well. And we need to build relationships, and we need to go to those people.
and, and his thing isn't like some big theological question. Yeah. It's like, will you give me a drink? Yeah, and I think also this is like the mind games that you pl- you play is like, okay, you know, the, here's this person. You know, I want to introduce the gospel to I kind of build a little bit of relationship. Okay, what do I say? What questions do I say? And he's just like, you know, will you give me a drink? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, and like, you have to you have to start a conversation of some kind, like of, of some kind, and it doesn't matter really what you, where you start with. Um, right. Yeah, and sometimes you gotta more make your opportunities. Phillips was very straightforward. That's like really like. <laughs> Uh, but like uh, this is like you just start a conversation and you and you start because nothing would ever happen if he didn't just say that simple thing will you give me a drink will you, and, and start that conversation and so like some of it's just starting a conversation um, and, and and letting it take you where it does find common interests it's good if you can make it about them people do only like to talk about themselves They'll love having conversation with you if you ask them questions uh, and be genuine. Um, love is the goal. And, and don't make it fake. Don't, like, fake that you are, that you are interested in them. Be, again, again, this goes to the heart, actually caring for them. You know, be genuinely interested in them. Genuinely want, que- uh, uh, want conversation. And, and ask questions. We don't know things about random people we come up to, like Jesus did in this case. So what do we got to do? Got to ask questions. And questions are, are really, really valuable. So, good. good. Anything else from this section? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, and, and like you, you're just using the situation and what what it can to present itself. And the funny thing is, it doesn't seem like he ever got his drink of water either. She he, she throws down his pitcher as we'll see and goes back to the village. But it, it, I think he accomplished what he wanted to in, in, in the long run. I think there's a little lot there. <laughs> um, but yeah. I've, I've known Christians who have said something like that. Uh, I've, I've known people who had, um, in Florida, uh, a member in the church who um, had a neighbor come in. They started a conversation, and they, they asked, you know, it, it, we're just new to the neighborhood. Do you know any good places to worship? And the, the Christian said, well, how do you lean? Where do you lean? And the person was like, well, I don't know, like, <laughs> and he said, "Well, I think you you really seem to fit with those, you know, those Baptist congregation." And I forgot what the thing was. Don't do that, like, <laughs> that's like a golden opportunity, like, and that's not how it's supposed to supposed to go. 
at all. It's presenting the gospel and like invite invite people to come. Um, but anyways, uh, next next um, next section. Um, John four ten through eighteen. Notice how he continues the conversation in verse ten. Jesus answered her, "If you knew the gift of God." Who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, said the woman, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. And indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and I have to keep coming here to draw the water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands. And the man you are now with is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. So what in this section can we learn about teaching the lost, evangelism, personal evangelism? Okay, in some ways. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, he says that you are not you are not married. Yeah, but but what does he do before he goes into her husband? Then what does he say first? Before that, was the the interaction and exchange before he says go call your husband? Yeah, he and what is he doing? Yeah, it's leading the way. He's taking the conversation from something that's very physical in nature and making it spiritual. He, he's, he's moving the conversation that way. Uh, because like what was said, is this could have easily just remained a physical conversation and, and nothing really would have affected or changed. This married woman would have, you know, the other day, some Jewish man talked to me. That was weird. Um, and that would have been it. But instead, he... he he intentionally changes, uh, moves the conversation to something of a spiritual level, um, which eventually, if we are to evangelize, we have to eventually do that. We eventually have to talk about spiritual things. We can't just talk about the weather and job and how bad your boss is and all those kinds of things. We have to, to uh, move the conversation spiritual, and he does that through uh, talking about, you know, this living water. Bill? Yeah. yeah. I, I th but I think you're picking up on the next thing, which is he's offering something that she desires or she wants um, it's something to pique her interest because if, if you had these things uh, the reason I, I kind of stopped the, the, the husband talk because if you flip these things how do you think she would reply to the husband comment well who are you what are you get doing getting in my business you know you asked me for a cup of water and then you know got in my personal like but once you pique their interest and you see that they have, you know, some value and, you know, this person is not normal um, as it is, you can then, um, of course, you won't do this usually in one conversation like Jesus did. But then you, you have a little bit more legitimacy into um, uh, asking about their um, their personal spiritual life. And I'm going 
talk about some ways that you can do that really gentle. Um, and and I, I think that's good. I, I think that needs to be not the first thing you probably lead with, though. I think that's eventually uh, pretty good. But um, if you lead with that, you're going to put people on defensive. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah. It, it, it's almost it almost feels like a like the Mormon evangelist. You know, have you met Jesus Christ or have you heard of Jesus Christ? And and so it feels like sales pitch almost, you know, hi, my name is Zach, I'm here with, you know, you know such and such company, we want to sell you a used car loan, you know, um, and, and so you don't want to feel, you want to make the gospel, evangelism should not feel like a sales pitch, because we're not selling them anything, we're sharing the best news ever with some friends, that's, that's how it should feel, and so it starts with a relationship, it starts with, 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 um, it starts with sharing good news about, you know, we talked about how it has affected my life, all those kinds of things. Um, but, yeah, got off track a little bit. Uh, anything else that, that um, from this? much so it's a very if you can ask questions they answer they ask you questions that is much better than a monologue kind of style good very good yeah right yeah yeah there, there is a little bit of who do you think you are there and like jesus doesn't really you know necessarily say yeah i am greater but he lets the what um the water that he offers kind of make that um known um he d he does it very well he's very crafty he's very gentle um he is very um precise with his words um and so he makes the best uh use of every single um exchange of words with him shirley did you have something He's, he's he's looking for every opportunity. He's good. Um, uh, where did you hear the conversation? It's not spiritual. He baits the hook. He 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 kind of um, um, alludes to something that she desires. We talked about what what do we have that people desire? Love, the truth. Those are two big things. Salvation. Um, all those kinds of things are are, are great. You you don't start the conversation with you're a sinner and you're going to hell. You go do the good news before the bad news. That's that's what you do. You do the good news, God loves you and wants a relationship with you. The bad news is is you are making it so that you can't have an intimate relationship with him. Good news again, God has made it so that through the sacrifice of his son that you can have that relationship with him like like he wants. You could be with him one day in, in paradise. So th 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 that's how he, he structures that. Um, again, these are not finite rules. Like there's times in which you can be the opposite, um, depending on the situation. These are not hard and fast rules, but I think they're good generalities of what to do. Um, he's also very gentle. So even when, um, even when he does say, you know, Go call your husband. Um, he's not accusatory. 
He's not saying you're an adulteress, you're a serial adulteress. What kind of woman are you? You're such a sinner. He, he, he lets the person realize their state, their, their spiritual state, all on their own. He, and this isn't also how he started the conversation. The, the saying is you want to put a pebble in their shoe, not a rock on their head. Um, you want to make them think about their spiritual state, not accuse them and, and, and drive them to a place where you just kill all opportunity. Um, you want them to think ab- about it in a very gentle way. No. Yes. I think I accidentally deleted a section of my notes. Yep. We'll get there in a second. So, yeah, we're not quite there. But, yeah, you're, you're good. You're good. You're getting to that place. But, yeah, good. Um, and, and something that you can do um, to, to um, like, encourage that conversation or to let people realize their sinful state is something like, do you know that Jesus, God, chose not to save good moral people? Do you know that? Now, that's what most people think, is that good moral people are who Jesus and God is going to save. But if you look at Romans 9, Acts 10... Um, just you know, logic, a good moral person was all you needed to do to be saved. The, the crucifixion is not really needed. Um, and so that makes people think. And again, it's not accusatory. It's not saying you think you're a good moral person and really you are a heathen sinner. You're not saying that. You're just kind of presenting the question, not even at them, just in general. But it, it helps them to reflect uh, on... Um, their own spiritual state. Does that, that make sense? Yes. Right. Yes. Well, in the like, if you can really, if, if someone, you know, kind of pokes that out a little more, you can say, okay, what is your definition of a good moral person? And then that's going to be totally different from this person's good definition and this person's different than this because we all have our definition of what it means to be a good moral person, and it just happens to be the condition that we are at that moment, um, which is how it always works. And so, yeah, and that, again, I think that's why the truth is very appealing. It's not relative based on the person. Um, it is one standard. Um, doesn't mean you can keep it perfectly, but you have a standard that you're striving to to meet. Good, too good. Anything else, real quick? Okay. Um, the next two minutes left. Um, verse nineteen through twenty six. He says, uh, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place where we worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and now come when truth worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit in and in will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the the Messiah called Christ is coming. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, "I, I, the one speaking to you, I am He. So, what, what from this section can you um, learn about how Jesus handled this? 
yeah, he so he kind of again baited hook, you know, kind of did it and let her kind of uh, ask a question again is what Dave was talking about. There's there's this this dialogue between the two. It shouldn't just be one person talking, one person not answering all the questions. It should be a dialogue, which I think is excellent. What else? How could have Jesus answered this question while being true but turned her off? Excellent. So he is he is saying, he's not saying, you have no idea what you're talking about. Basically, in so many words, you're dumb. He does not say that. Um, they could have very easily said that and been accurate or true. Uh, but instead, he, he says the truth. He doesn't hide from it. But he says it in a very gentle way. And then he gets back to the real issue, which is her and, and worshipers and seeking God and that kind of stuff. Uh, and so he brings it back to her. So you'll have this all the time when you're teaching people. You'll you'll be exploring the Bible. You'll bring up spiritual conversation and be like, you are the people that believe you're the only ones going to heaven. Or you're the people that don't believe in instrumental music. Or you name a billion other things that they would say. And those things you can answer in a very gentle way in a very non-consenting way, still say the truth. Again, it doesn't matter what we believe, what the Bible believes. I don't, uh, we don't believe that. The Bible says that, and we believe the Bible. Um, and, and, and you can do it in a very gentle way, non-condescending way, um, and, and get it back to the person. Don't let all these other topics that we'll bring up about the Holy Spirit and aliens and Ezekiel and all these kinds of things distract you from the real conversation that needs to happen, which is this person's salvation. And so keep it focused on that. Because honestly, these other things don't matter until that one is sin is addressed. And so people will have little things that they'll need to work on, little misunderstandings of doctrine or scriptures. And I don't worry about that stuff. I don't debate that stuff necessarily until we have achieved their right state with God. And that's what really focus on. And that's what he brings it back to, to focus on. Um, okay. Um, we'll stop there. We'll finish up this, um, this uh, the rest of this story. I don't think it should take very long. Uh, we'll finish up the rest of the story next week and then look at um, the process of becoming uh, a Christian. So if you want to reread this, you know, think about it, meditate on it. I'll ask for your, for your feedback, and we'll um, get into that. So thank you for your, your uh, comments and your questions. Appreciate it.